Alright, so this is our uh, first video in the introduction to rings. This is either for sort of the end of an abstract algebra class or just thought of as a review at the start of Algebra 2. So let's start at the very beginning. Let's start with the definition of a ring. So let's suppose that R is a set that comes along with two binary operations. We're going to denote those by addition and multiplication. And we want it to satisfy some properties. So whenever we take three elements, A, B, and C in the set R, we want each of the following properties to be satisfied. The first is we'd like the set R to be an abelian group with respect to addition. And we're going to call the additive identity 0 instead of E as we did with groups very frequently. The second property that we need to satisfy, I've written it in symbols here, but what we need is we need for our multiplication operation to be associative. And the third thing that we need to happen is we need for this multiplication to distribute over the addition operation. And we need it not to matter if we distribute from the left or if we distribute from the right. Before we really proceed, I want to go back and I want to take some notes on what that definition is saying and what it's not saying. So the first thing I want us to take note of is that our, although it's not written explicitly as a property that needs to be satisfied, baked into that definition is that rings must be closed uh, and satisfy associativity under both addition and the multiplication. So when we make the statement that we need two binary operations on the set R, that's saying that we need closure under the operations of addition and of multiplication. And our second bullet point in that definition of a ring was that our multiplication be associative. So these are two of the properties that we require a group to satisfy. However, the other two group axioms, which are um, inverses and identity, are not required of the multiplication operation. They're required for the addition operation, but they're not required for the multiplication. And so it is not necessary for a ring to satisfy these properties. If it happens to be the case that our set R contains a multiplicative identity, it doesn't have to, but if it does, then we're going to say that the set R is a ring with unity. That multiplicative identity is called the unity of the ring. Uh, and in the case that we have a multiplicative identity, we're going to denote this by 1. And we don't require that inverses exist. However, in the case that we have an element with a multiplicative inverse inside our ring, we're going to call that element a unit. And the collection of units in a particular ring is denoted u of r. And the last note that we really want to make about this definition is that we are not requiring that the multiplication be a commutative operation. We're requiring that of the addition, but not of the multiplication. If our ring happens to be uh, commutative with respect to multiplication, then we will call the ring a commutative ring. Uh, and I also want to note that this is really the reason that when we list the distributive property on the previous slide, that we have two different versions of the distributive property. One where we distribute the multiplication from the left, and one where we distribute the multiplication from the right. Uh, because we're not requiring that our multiplication be commutative, we really need to require that the distributive property be satisfied in both directions. Now the next thing I think we should discuss are some examples of rings. Uh, and the first example of a ring, and really a good example of a ring, is the set of integers. And this is a commutative ring. Uh, it doesn't matter the order in which you multiply and it has a unity, that unity is the number 1. We would denote it by 1 anyways, but here it literally is the number 1. And if you wanted to know what the set of units in the integers is, it's the unity that will always be an element of the units of a ring, should the unity exist, uh, but also the number negative 1, since negative 1 times negative 1 will give us the unity, positive 1. Uh, if you pick any other integer, 5 for instance, then its multiplicative identity would be 1 fifth, and although that's a rational number, it's not an integer. Now, our second example of a ring, very similar to our first example, is the integers mod n, uh, where n is a positive integer. This is also going to be a commutative ring. Basically, it's commutative because multiplication is commutative if it's done modularly or not. 
uh, and there's a unity here as well. And U of n here is the collection of units, but U of n varies based on what you've chosen your n to be in this example. As our third example, I'm going to write m sub n of f. This is the set of n by n matrices, where the entries in those matrices come from a specific set f. Um, we're going to typically take the set f to be either the integers, the integers mod n for some n, maybe the rational numbers, the real numbers, or perhaps even the complex numbers. This is a good example to keep in mind because this is a non-commutative ring. Right? Although it is true that you can add uh, matrices in any order, that's the addition is commutative part, matrix multiplication is something we know is not commutative. Um, so this is a good example to keep in mind as a, something, an example where you don't have a commutative ring. And the next example is still going to be a commutative ring with unity. Um, this is going to be polynomial, what we call polynomial rings. This is f adjoined x. Um, again, we're going to specify that our set f is either the integers, the integers mod n, rational numbers, real numbers, complex numbers. Those are typically the choices we'll make for the set f. Um, still a commutative ring, ring with unity, as I said, but just a slightly different example, slightly less familiar example than the integers uh, or the integers mod n.